Genesis 4 is where we're going to go this morning. Today we're going to be talking about unintended consequences. In the 1930s, there was a German art school that received an application for a young man. They took that application and they turned him down. So a year later, he applied again. And they turned him down again. And so he gave up on his aspirations of art and decided to take on a new project of politics. And that young man's name was Adolf Hitler. And some historians believe that if he had gotten into art school, and I think it makes sense, right, that he, he probably wouldn't have done the things that he did. And that art school had no idea at the moment that that application they received, that mediocre application, was going to have such a massive ripple into the future. I think you can probably imagine and remember times in your life where you've made a decision that seemed small, that seemed insignificant, that turned out to have a massive ripple into the future. Today we're going to talk about two family lines, one of Cain and one of Seth, both Adam's sons. And whenever we talk about genealogies, whenever we read these genealogies from the Bible, it's really easy to just kind of, you know, run through them because it's just a bunch of names and numbers and dates and who cares. But every single word of the Bible is important, is valuable, is meaningful for us including the genealogies. And I think this morning, what we'll see, hopefully, is that in this genealogy, we see two lines, one marked by perpetual patterns of sin and another marked by perpetual patterns of godliness. And that the decisions of the father at the beginning of these genealogies carry down through generations. So let me pray for us this morning, and we'll get into this together. Lord God, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for your word that gives us hope, that teaches us truth, that gives us a light in the darkness of this world, that, that we are able to see the standard, that we have, are given a, an outline of what it means to be righteous, and that we get to see a glimpse of you and who you are. And so this morning, Lord, we ask that you would show us your glory as we read your scriptures this morning. That you would give us a warning and a promise. That you would encourage us to live godly and holy lives. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Genesis chapter 4. Verse 17 is where we're going to start today. And I'm going to give you the main idea right off the top, and that's this. The ripples of sin and of righteousness often go further than we expect. The ripples of sin and righteousness often go further than we expect. Verse 17. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Erod, and Erod fathered Mahujael, and Mahujael fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech. So now here we are five generations later. And if we can take the timeline of the other lineage we're about to read, we're talking about several hundred years since Cain killed Abel. And we have basically nothing at all said about Cain's descendants they just are names until we get to Lamech in verse 19. And Lamech, it says, Lamech took two wives. That's already not good. The name of the one was Adah, and the other was Zillah. Adah bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. So here are Lamech's children. They have contributed all these interesting things to human society and culture. And yet, Moses, the author of Genesis, sums up Lamech's story, not by their, their contributions, but by something else. Here's how he closes this line. Verse 23, Lamech said to his wives, 
Ada and Zillah. Hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's revenge is seventy-sevenfold. And that's it. That is the end of Cain's legacy. This little vignette into the life of, of Cain and his descendants. And that's all we have. And the reality is here, five generations later, things have not gotten better. They've gotten worse. Cain killed his brother, and Lamech, his great-great-great-grandson, announces and brags about a murder that he has committed, and he brags about it to his polygamous wives. And so even though there are advancements in technology, like I said, they are still tainted by Cain's legacy. Lamech is a murderer, and he's proud of it. And notice what's missing in Cain's legacy here. There is not a single mention of God anywhere in these verses. It seems that they had completely abandoned the Lord, just like Cain, and just like Cain had taught them to do. But then we have another family line, verse 25. It says, Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also was born a son, and he called his name Enosh. And at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So now here in contrast to Cain's line, who had abandoned God, Seth's son calls upon the name of the Lord. And this walking with God is going to characterize the line of Seth that we're about to see more formally laid out in chapter 5. So here we go, chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam, or of man. When God created man, he made him in the image of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man. When they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. And thus all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Okay, so I know we need to stop here for a second because you're probably thinking, wow, Adam had Seth at 130? And he lived for 930 years. What is going on here? Well, in the early days of humanity, according to Scripture, we apparently much, had much longer lifespans. We, people lived longer. Remember, though, God had made man to live forever. And truthfully, there is no reason that human beings have to die. Our bodies are amazing things. They self-regenerate all the time. And theoretically, as long as we have food and water, our bodies could continue to live for a thousand years or even more than that. And so we're going to see next week, excuse me, in chapter 6, that God limits man's lifespan to 120 years as a further judgment because of the wickedness of man's heart. But right after Eden, where we're at now, there were people living for nearly a thousand years. That's what the Bible says. Verse 6, when Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he had fathered Enosh 807 years and had other sons and daughters. And thus all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he fathered Kenan. Enosh lived after he fathered Kenan 815 years, and he had other sons and daughters. And thus all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. When Kenan had lived 70 years, he fathered Mahalalel. Kenan lived after he had fathered Mahalalel 840 years and had other sons and daughters. And thus all the days of Kenan were 910 years and he died. And then in verse 10, we have Mahalalel, who is the father of Jared. And then Jared has Enoch. And now verse 21, Enoch. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah for 300 years and had other sons and daughters. And thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years, which is quite a bit shorter. And verse 24 tells us why. Enoch walked with God, and then he was not, for God took him. This is interesting here. Again, we're, we're looking at the righteous line here of Seth. And Enoch was apparently so holy, so godly, he walked with God so well that God saw fit to honor him, to bless him by not letting him die, but instead by taking him on to heaven like he did to Elijah. Hebrews 11, 5 through 6 comments on this. 
It says, By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. And now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So here halfway through the line of Seth, we have a very different picture of this group of people, this family legacy, right? Whereas Lamech had two wives and was running around killing people and bragging about it, Enoch was so holy that God took him on to heaven without letting him die. Give him Methuselah, lived for a long time. <clears throat> then verse 28, he had Lamech, and when Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. And so now we have another Lamech, right? This is, the, this is a different Lamech. And this Lamech, rather than boasting about his sins, dedicates his son in the hope of a new and better world to God. Noah is, sounds like the Hebrew word for rest, that name Noah. And whenever you read in Scripture that somebody named their son such and such, saying this, that is a good indication that they are explaining what the name means. And so Noah means rest, but it also has this connotation of comfort, right? That out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief or comfort from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. And then verse 32, after Noah was 500 years old, he was a little bit of a late bloomer apparently, Noah fathered Shem and Ham and Japheth. And that's the end of chapter 5. And that's where we're going to leave off today. Next week, we're going to talk about Noah. Noah has a nice long story. We're going to break that down into a couple of different sections and episodes because there's a lot going on with Noah. But today, what I want us to get from this genealogy that maybe you've read and just kind of skipped over in your mind is that the ripples of sin and of righteousness often go further than we expect. Let's, think, let's talk about sin for a minute. So number one, Sinful patterns, sinful patterns can last for generations. Sinful patterns can last for generations. So the first family line is the line of Cain, and it is a story of generational sin. Cain's sinful ways were passed down to his son, and to his son, and then to his son, all the way down to Lamech, who ends up as an arrogant murderer, as we've said, and then he took that mark of Cain as a badge of honor rather than as a consolation of God's mercy, which it was. Because you remember last week we talked about Cain. Cain killed his brother. God cursed him with judgment. And Cain says, no, Lord, this is too much. And so God puts a mark on Cain so that anyone who sees him will not kill him. And Lamech is like, hey, I want a mark too. And instead of sevenfold, I want 77-fold. And so what we see from this line is that the effects of a father's sin can translate all the way down. We also see this same principle in the life of David. And David, remember, was the man after God's own heart, and yet he was not perfect. He made some very serious mistakes and committed some very serious sins. David, remember, was king of Israel, the second king of Israel after Saul, who was really bad. David was a lot better. David at least wanted to please the Lord. He cared what God thought. And yet, David, in his later years, got complacent, and he got spiritually lazy. And the Bible tells us that at the time when kings were supposed to go off to war, David wasn't at war. He was back at home, just hanging out. And apparently, he was looking out his window... And he saw a woman on the roof of her house bathing. And that's not a weird thing. It's weird to us. But that was, that was common in those days, that you would bathe on the roof of your house. Because who's going to see you on the roof, first of all? But second of all, you know, you don't want to get your house all wet because they surely didn't have the kind of technology that we have to clean and dry and all of those kind of things. So she's doing a normal thing. She thinks she's in private. and She's on the roof of her house and she's taking a bath. 
And David sees her, and he likes what he sees. And so David, who already has a couple of wives, which he really shouldn't have done, sends for Bathsheba. He sends some of his messengers, and they go to her, and they say, the king wants you. And you don't get to turn down the king, right? And so she comes, and she goes to the palace where David is, and he takes advantage of her in a sexual way. She gets pregnant, and David starts to panic because he thought he was going to get to have this secret sin, and it turns out that it's not going to be so secret. Her husband, meanwhile, is off at the war that David was supposed to be at. And so David, rather than come clean and say, I've done a horrible thing, what does he do? Well, he tries to bring her, he brings her husband back. And his hope is that he can bring the hus- her husband back and get them to get together. And then her husband will think that it's his baby and not David's and nobody will know and it'll be covered up. And so her husband comes home from the war and he says, hey, you know what? Why don't you enjoy some rest? Go spend some time with your wife. And he's too honorable of a man. And he says, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. My men are off fighting. How, how, could, I, how could I enjoy time at home when my men are dying in battle? And so David says, okay, if he's not going to do what I wanted him to do there, let's put him on the front line so he'll just die. And then I can marry her and no one will care. And so that's what he does. He essentially murders her husband And then he marries her. And God was obviously not pleased with that. And through the prophet Nathan, God revealed to David his displeasure. And David realized what he had done, which you think, man, David, you should have understood what you were doing like a long time ago. But he understands what he'd done and he goes to the Lord and he confesses and he begs for God's forgiveness and God forgives him. And yet God says there will be consequences. And the consequences that baby... That is, in, that is in Bathsheba's womb is going to die. And that's exactly what happens. And yet from that point on, David's life starts to descend, right? There, there's never another high point in David's life like the ones when he was young, when he was holy, when he was righteous, when he was doing God's will constantly, when he was doing exactly what God had commanded him to. From that point on, David's ministry, his legacy, his life is tainted by this sin. And David ends up with 70 children, because again, he's got a bunch of wives, which he was not supposed to do in the first place. And his children turn out to be a bunch of jerks, basically. Uh, Two of his sons, well, one of his sons takes advantage of one of his daughters, and then one of his other sons decides... He's going to come after him for revenge, and they both end up dead. And then David's son Solomon, who is Bathsheba's son, not the one that died, obviously, but the next one, he becomes the next king. And so you look at that and you see, man, that is kind of a tainted legacy, but it gets worse than that, because then Solomon, God tells him, hey, don't collect a bunch of wives. Just don't do it. They're going to lead your heart astray. You're going to end up in a bad place. And Solomon says, hmm, I think I'll collect a bunch of wives. And so he ends up with hundreds of wives, wives from all these different tribes. And by the end of his life, we're told in 1 Kings 11, 4, when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. And so Solomon here has compromised. And then what happens? Well, Solomon's son takes the kingdom. And there's another man who wants to be the king. And so they begin to fight with each other. And eventually the kingdom splits in two. And then it doesn't take long. And several generations later, they have completely perverted the worship of God. They have lost the book of the law. And the kingdom has descended into chaos. And you can trace that all the way back to one night in David's room when he was looking out a window and he made a choice to do what God had commanded him not to do. Sinful patterns can last for generations. And don't we see this happening in real life? I mean, I think we do. I I know I can give you tons of examples. 
You know, sometimes you, especially when you're, when you're hanging out with kids, you, you meet a kid and he's just the worst. And you're like, oh my gosh, what is wrong with this kid? Well, then you meet his parents and you're like, okay, well now I understand. And then you meet his grandparents and you're like, well now I understand this whole family tree. And probably at some point you can trace that back and find that there was a, there was a patriarch of that family who stopped leading in godliness or who led the family down paths of unrighteousness. Sometimes it's a little less subtle, or a little more subtle, excuse me. Maybe grandpa went to church every week. But then, or great-grandpa, excuse me. Then grandpa, well, he just, you know, we'll just, we'll get there once a month maybe. And so his son learns, well, church is not that important. And so he doesn't go to church except for on Christmas and Easter. And then Finally, then the son, he's seen the legacy of unrighteousness and this lack of church, and it just devolves to the point that, well, now he's not a believer at all. He doesn't know God at all. But it always starts at one place. There's always a point. There's always a decision that's made that has a ripple down through an entire family. Sometimes unrepentant sin bears consequences far into the future. And even the things that we think surely will only affect me can leave a legacy of sinfulness throughout our entire family line, just like Cain. But here's the flip side of that, right? So lest we leave hopeless. Number two is devotion to God. Devotion to God can last for generations. Devotion to God can last for generations. Seth's line. Seth Seth feared the Lord, and Enosh, his son, called upon the name of the Lord. And then we go all the way down to Noah, and as you guys know the story of Noah and the ark, Noah is the only man, Noah and his family, who survive the flood. Because Noah was blameless in God's sight, the scripture tells us. With that devotion to God trickled all the way down. It rippled all the way down, ten generations, to Noah. We see the same thing in, the, in Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Remember, Abraham, according to legend, was the son of an idolater, someone who made idols for a living. And God calls Abraham out of that family. And Abraham says, okay, I'll go. I'll go with God. And he breaks that cycle of idolatry. And Abraham goes and God makes a covenant with him because of his faith. Then Abraham has Isaac. And then Isaac has Jacob. And as we read the Old Testament, we see God constantly referred to by one of, one of his names, which is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, which is a callback to a family line. Again, because of the faithfulness of one man, we have this ripple of righteousness that comes all the way down. And again, we see this in real life, don't we? There are so many situations where we see a father say, I'm going to change my family. I'm going to break the cycle. I'm going to not do what my father did, and I'm going to follow God instead. And it may seem like this is this horrible struggle against an entire family, and it can be sometimes. And yet the ripple of righteousness can go far beyond our family and our life, generations down the line. Proverbs 22.6 says this, train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he's old, he will not depart from it. Or Ephesians 6, 4 encourages fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And why? Because when we raise godly children, they raise godly children too. And when we fail to raise godly children, typically they don't raise godly children after us. So sin has far-reaching consequences into the future, and devotion to God can have far-reaching consequences into the future. But here's a little caveat. I didn't number this, but the next blank is this. Our family history is not our destiny. Our family history is not our destiny. When we look at Cain's line, I don't want us to look at Lamech, get all the way down to Lamech and say, well, you know, he just was part of a bad family. So, 
Of course he did some bad things. No, that doesn't excuse his behavior, right? Our family history is not our destiny. It explains Lamech, but it doesn't excuse him. And the reality is God often saves people out of terrible families. And sometimes terrible people come out of righteous families too. This is not a promise from God. This is not a a hard and fast declaration. If you serve God, your great-great-grandchildren will serve God too. It's not a promise, but it is a principle. It is what tends to happen. It is the way that the world works. It is the way that God has designed family to be. On the negative side, another example is, is Esau, right? Esau was the son of Isaac and the grandson of Abraham. And yet Esau was not faithful to God. Esau sold his birthright for a single meal, right? He broke the, the cycle in a bad way. This righteous family, or this righteous line, even though they had their problems, they produced an unrighteous offspring. And then on the positive side, though, we have Paul from the New Testament. Paul, who was raised to be zealous for Judaism, or what he thought was Judaism, his, his efforts to be faithful to God turned out to be him fighting against God. And yet, what does God do? God doesn't say, no, 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 Paul, you're from a bad family. I can't use you. No. He rescues Paul in the middle of his persecution of Christians. He converts Paul, and Paul meets Christ on the road, and Paul is changed forever. Our family history is not our destiny. I mentioned Abraham already, but he's another example. Abraham, whose family line was was not good, right? They were not righteous. They were worshiping other gods. And yet God came to Abraham and said, I want you to do something with me. And Abraham said, okay, let's do it. Our family history is not our destiny. And here's the last thought today. Related to this, but all of Scripture, I think, not only gives us, not only gives us principles for life, not only teaches us who God is, but all of Scripture is pointing to Jesus in some way. All of Genesis, I want you to see this as we go. We've been talking about these connections to Jesus. They all point to Jesus in some way. And so here's the Christ connection for today. God preserved a faithful line from which the Redeemer would come. That's Jesus. God preserved a faithful line from which the Redeemer would come. Because remember, God told the serpent in the curse in Genesis 3 foot 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And remember, the serpent is the devil, right? That's what's going on here. I'm going to put enmity between you. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And I think what we have here is this, what sometimes is called the, the proto-evangelion. It's the, it's the first mention, the first inkling of the gospel that Satan was not going to get to run over the earth forever, but that one would come who was going to bruise his head. Or as we said, the Hebrew can also be translated there, crush your head. He will crush your head. And Eve... No doubt when Cain killed Abel, was thinking, man, is this going to be, what, what's, what are we going to do? Who's going to crush the serpent's head now? And yet when Seth was born, that new line was started and God preserved it. Luke 3.36, Luke lays out the genealogy of Jesus all the way down. And here's the way he ends it. Luke 3.36, the son of Canaan, the son of Arpachshad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. And that's, that's the end of the genealogy of Jesus. He takes it all the way back, not to Cain, but to Seth. Because God was not going to be mocked. He was not going to forget his promise to Eve that there would be one who would come and crush the serpent's head. And that's who we have in Christ. The Christ comes all the way down from Seth, not from Cain, but from Seth. The righteous line that produced the Redeemer himself. 
the one who came and not only crushed the devil, but rescued us from sin, who brought Eden back, who opened again the way to the tree of life, as we had said, that he was the one who died for sin, who rose from the dead, and who now sits at the right hand of the throne of God. The one who welcomes us by faith to come and enter into a new family line, to be adopted as sons and daughters of God through Jesus Christ. So here's my last thoughts today. I want us to just consider a couple of questions together. First is, have you submitted your life to Jesus Or are you living by your own rules? Because the difference between these two lines that we see Cain and Seth is that one of them loved the Lord and the other did not. And so that's the first question we have to answer. Do you love God or not? Have you submitted your life to God or not? Have you called upon the name of the Lord or not? Because the Apostle Paul uses those same words in Romans 10 and he says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so before you can even think about changing your family line, before you can even think about the legacy you're going to leave, you've got to say, do I belong to God or not? Because if not, you have no hope of a good family line. But God can take even the messiest, most sinful person and flip them upside down. So have you submitted your life to Jesus or are you living by your own rules? And if you've submitted your life to Jesus, then the next question is this, what kind of ripples am I making? What kind of ripples am I making? Am I living in a way that is setting up myself and my family for a righteous future or not? Am I pursuing the things of God and am I bringing my family along to do the same or am I pursuing the things of the world? And that ties into the last question, which is what kind of family legacy will we leave? What kind of family legacy will I leave? Because the things we do today have ripples far into the future. And by God's help, by trusting in Christ, by following him, by doing what God calls us to do, we can leave a legacy of righteousness. Or if we decide to go our own way, there is only one way for that legacy to go. Let me pray for us. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for the Bible. We thank you for teaching us. We thank you for even these strange genealogies that we have to sift through and try to understand. Lord, I ask today that you would give give us faith. Give us better, deeper, and greater faith. Give us a deep love for you. Give us a love for your glory that we might do everything that we do for your glory alone. Lord, and as we trust you, as we walk in the newness of life that was bought for us by Christ Jesus, as we repent of our sins and seek after holiness, God, we ask that you would bless our efforts and that the things that we do would ripple into the future and into eternity. That even when we don't see the outcome and the consequences of our righteousness, Lord, comfort us with the truth that you never waste anything, that every act of obedience has, has ripples that we don't understand, that every act of righteousness, even when people don't see it, has an effect into the future and into eternity. Oh, but remind us also that in the same way, every act of sin, every public sin and every secret sin also has a ripple. God, rescue us from sin that we might walk in righteousness, that the legacy we leave would glorify your name. Amen.